بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الأنبياء وعلى آله الأسكياء وأصحابه الأتقياء أما بعد One day Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was with Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. And the two of them were walking somewhere and they passed by a shepherd that was grazing some animals for Uqba bin Abi Mu'it. They said to the shepherd, Ya Ghulam, hal min laban? That is there any milk that you can serve to us? They were exhausted, a little thirsty. So the shepherd responded back by saying, Naam, walakinni mu'tamanun. Yes, there is milk. However, I have been entrusted with these animals and it is not mine to give away. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidina Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an understood what he, where he was coming from. The Prophet ﷺ always promoted his companions to be trustworthy. He himself was known as Al Amin. So when the shepherd said that he was unable to give, the Prophet ﷺ then asked him, Hal min shatin lam yanzu alayha al fahl? That is there any animal that has not been mated with? So if it's unmated, that means that there is no uh, possibility that it will deliver any milk, so you have nothing to worry about. فَأَتَيْتُهُ بِشَاتٍ The shepherd says, I came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with an animal. فَمَسَحَ ذِرْعَهَا Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he rubbed his hand against the udder of the animal. In one narration, as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was touching the udder of the animal, he was invoking the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillah rahman rahim فَنَزَلَ لَبَن So the milk began to fill into the udder of the animal. فَحَلَبَ فِي إِنَائٍ He milked the animal into a bowl. فَشَرِبَ وَسَقَى أَبَا بَكْرِ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam drank and then also gave to Sayyidina Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And then the Prophet ﷺ addressed the udder of the animal and said, Uqlus, stop. Faqalas, all the milk stopped. The young man, he saw all of this amazed, blown away. He understood animals and knew how milk was produced and this was all miraculous. Nothing here made any sense. So he said to Rasulullah ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, alimni min hadha al-qawl. Teach me what you just said. Teach me more about this Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim of yours. Famasaha ra'si. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he put his hand over the head of Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu. Wa qal yirhamuka Allah, innaka ghulamun muhallamun. That may Allah's mercy be upon you. You are a well-learned man. Great things will come from you. This is one of the first interactions that Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an has with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says that I was the seventh person to accept Islam. Sorry, sixth companion to accept Islam. And other than us six, وَمَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ مُسْلِمٌ غَيْرُنَا There was not one person who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the first six. The famous historian Muhammad ibn Ishaq, he says, أَسْلَمَ إِبْنُ مُسْعُودٍ بَعْدَ إِثْنَيْنِ وَعِشْرِينَ نَفْسًا That Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an was the 22nd companion to accept Islam. Some of the scholars while trying to determine when Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an accepted Islam, they say, it was prior to the Prophet's arrival in Dar al Arqam. Ibn Mas'ud was with the Prophet of Allah right from the beginning. 
He was one of the companions that went on to migrate to Abyssinia when things became difficult in Mecca Mukarramah. He then returned back. He studied with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and was by the side of Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam every step every step of the way. He says over 70 surahs of the Quran I learned directly from the mouth of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is and out of 114 70 of them I heard and I learned I memorized them directly from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So many ayat of the Qur'an that were revealed about the earlier companions of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As those verses, verses were being revealed, they were directed at the people around the Prophet of Allah. And in so many of those cases, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an was one of the people sitting right next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So as the Qur'an is addressing the companions and speaking to the body of the companions, but the immediate khitab, was to the people that were right there, primarily, first and foremost, and Ibn Mas'ud says, I was generally one of those people. I know where the ayat of the Qur'an were revealed. And there is not a verse of the Qur'an that I do not know the backdrop of why it was revealed and what caused that verse to reveal. Ibn Mas'ud was one of the greatest scholars of the Qur'an. Sa'd radiallahu anhu narrates that one day we were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in total, wa nahnu sittatu, we were six people. The mushrikun came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said to him that we are willing to sit with you if you remove these six people around you. They're nobodies, no names, they're poor people, they're from the lower class of society, we don't want to be seen with them. So remove these people and we will be with you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always had this desire that the Quraysh would sit with him and just open-mindedly listen to his message. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, he says, وَكُنْتُ أَنَا No, sorry, Sa'ad radiallahu an says, كُنْتُ أَنَا وَابْنُ مَسْعُون وَرَجُلٌ مِنْ هُذَيْلِ وَرَجُلَانِ نَسِيتُ إِسْمَهُمَا There were six of us, and from those six, Sa'ad says, I was one of them, and Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an was also one of them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this desire to step aside from these companions and go and sit with the leaders of the Quraysh. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَلَا تَطْرُدِ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِيِّ يُرِيدُونَ وَجْهَهُ وَلَا تَعْدُ عَيْنَاكَ عَنْهُمْ That you do not turn away from people who spend their, um, who, who call out to their Lord in the morning and evening seeking His pleasure. Allah said regarding these companions that these are the people يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ بِالْغَدَاتِ وَالْعَشِي who call out to their Lord every morning and evening. This is a verification of their righteousness. And yuriduna wajhahu. And these are people that purely and solely seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One thing amazing about Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an is that he built this relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he became like family. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an says, قَدِمْتُ أَنَا وَأَخِي مِنَ الْيَمَنِ My brother and I arrived from Yemen to visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We stayed with Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for some time. وَمَا نَحْسِبُ إِبْنَ مَسْعُودٍ إِلَّا مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم. And we were convinced that Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an was actually one of the family members of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لِكَثْرَةِ دُخُولِهِمْ وَخُرُوجِهِمْ عَلَيْهِ Because they came and went Ibn Mas'ud was one of those people who was so frequent in the gathering of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's khas khadim, he was the one that carried the secrets of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the one that carried the pillow of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam desired to lay down somewhere, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu would rush and present the necessities so the Prophet of Allah can lay in comfort. Wasiwakihi, he would carry the miswak of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa na'alayhi, he would carry the slippers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa tuhurihi, he would also carry the water for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the scenario where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needed to use the washroom or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needed to perform wudu. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an was ready for all of it. هَذَا يَكُونُ فِي السَّفَرِ When the Prophet ﷺ was on a journey, 
he was like a shadow to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Qasim ibn Abdul Rahman says, "Kana Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an would present and the, the the slippers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to him when Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam desired to walk, as the Prophet of Allah would leave a majlis. This beloved companion, this man who had so much muhabba for the Prophet of Allah." would hold the slippers of the Prophet of Allah in his arm, and then would put them by the feet of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. ثُمَّ يَمْشِي أَمَامَهُ بِالْعَصَى And then he would clear the path in front of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make sure where the Prophet of Allah would walk, there was no danger or harm there. حَتَّى إِذَا أَتَى مَجْلِسَهُ نَزَعًا عَلَيْهِ فَأَدْخَلَهُمَا فِي ذِرَاعِهِ When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would arrive to the gathering, Ibn Masood was the one that would then pick up the slippers of the Prophet and put them back on his side. And um, even when Nabi went into a room, Ibn Masood would enter into that room before Rasulullah. When they would be traveling and the Prophet of Allah would wake up in the middle of the night, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood would already be awake waiting for the Prophet. That what does the Prophet of Allah need? This right here, my friends, is a brief insight into the energy the companions carried when it came to the khidmah of Rasulullah wasallam. They never stepped back. They understood this lesson. There's a famous saying in Urdu, we say, khidmat se khuda milta hai. That a person attains the love of God. A person finds themselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa ta'ala opens up doors for them through the khidmah of seniors. Specifically, the khidmah of people of ilm. And for the companions, the khidmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wherever we traveled in the world, no matter what part of the world I've gone to, and uh, just laid my eyes on senior scholars of the deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always blessed them with righteous students who understood the honor of the scholar and dedicated themselves to the khidmah of those scholars. Shaykh al-Hind rahmatullahi alayhi, when he was sent off to Malta uh, by the British, Shaykh Hussein Ahmad Madani rahimahullah ta'ala kind of forced himself into prison as well. He was not captured, he had nothing to do with prison. But he said, if you're taking my shaykh, I'd like to go to prison with him so I can do khidmah of my shaykh. And he sent himself off to prison. And during the time that Shaykh al-Hind rahmatullahi alayhi was in prison, Shaykh Hussein Ahmad Madni rahimahullah ta'ala did his khidmah. When we were students, one of the, there, were, there was a part of the curriculum that you had to study and you would be quizzed on and tested on and the teachers would teach it in class and it was, you know, what you studied every day. But then there were certain books that every student had to read, Kharji Mutala, on their own. You would be tested on them at the end of the year. One of the books that our Sheikh had us read was a biography of a scholar from the subcontinent by the name of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Raipuri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, from Raipur. And he talks about his own journey. He says that his, his Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Rahim, when he went on Hajj, he accompanied his shaykh. And in that, during that journey, while they were on the ship heading towards Haramain, Shaykh Abdul Rahim, Rahimullah Ta'ala's son, became very sick. And um, he couldn't keep any of the contents of his stomach. And so they would just pass through. Anything he would eat, it would just pass through all the time. So Shaykh Abdul Qadir says that my shaykh was very old and his son was there and he needed some assistance taking care of him. So I spent the whole journey of Hajj just cleaning the young man's stool. Just cleaning it all the time. Wherever he would mess his clothes up, I would clean it and just, you know, throw it out and clean it again and throw it out. And he said it was that khidmah during that safar of hajj that my sheikh, after that day, he never forgot me again. He remembered me for the rest of his life. That on that journey of hajj, the khidmah that he offered to him. Never forget the importance of khidmah. This is something that we lost when we arrived in the West. We don't know who the scholars are anymore. We don't know what their khidmah means anymore. The izzah of ilm went out the window. People in their quest for equal everything 
forgot the honor of the Hufad and the people of Hadith. You can find a person who has dedicated their life to teaching Hadith in the community, and not one person in the congregation knows their name. The truth is that there is no loss to the scholar. نِعْمَ الرَّجْلُ الْفَقِيهُ فِي الدِّينِ إِنْ حَتِيجَ إِلَيْهِ نَفْعَ وَإِنْ اسْتُغْنِ عَنْهُ أَغْنَى نَفْسَهُ Because when he is needed, he will deliver. And when he is not needed, he'll go back to his Allah Allah. But it's the people in the congregation who actually lose out. Who miss out from the opportunity of being in the company of the righteous and learning from them and studying with them and understanding what this deen really has to offer. When you sit with these senior people, when you sit with teachers, when you study the deen from others, you don't just learn the knowledge. The book is the door, but the, the, the teacher is the key to that door. The teacher opens up that door. When you see people who study the deen from books, you will see them know a lot of content, but they will be completely barren of etiquette. And they won't know how ilm looks practically. What does it look like? When is there a time for a person to speak? And when should they stay silent? When do you stand up? When do you sit down? When do you lower your gaze? When do you raise your gaze? These things, Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala's mother, when she decided for him to study the deen, she took him to Rabia. And she said, sit in his gathering and learn his character before you learn his deen. Learn from his character first. And in today's world, that character is gone. That tarbiya is gone. The people in our community that are out there speaking from the mimbars and the ones that are giving the khutbahs and the ones that are speaking at this program and that program and doing this da'wah and doing, going out here and there, you ask them that how much time have you actually spent in the company of a true scholar of the deen? We're barren of numbers again. There's nothing there. It's a little gathering here, a little gathering there. We've become a YouTube generation that one lecture here, one lecture there. Those people are gone that say that I spent 10 years in the company of a scholar. And I learned to be a student before I decided to do any teaching at all. You look at Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani Sahib and his brother, Mufti Muhammad Rafi Usmani Sahib, Allah shower his mercy on the entire family. When they studied with Dr. Abdul Hayla Arafi, Allah Arhamhu, Dr. Abdul Hayla Arafi did not allow them to speak for almost 17 years after they graduated. After they graduated. And look at the young man and, and, and woman today who have spent no time in the company of scholars and have had no tarbiyah done, being the first to get up after salah to give a khatira and lecture. Now I understand that when there is a need, everyone should stand up. Chika, chibate. You should stand up if there is a need. If there's no one to give khutbah and you have the knowledge, get up and give the khutbah. But that doesn't mean that you should just continue like this in a, term, in a, in a state of necessity without changing yourself. If the young man has a desire to give a Jummah khutbah or he's been called to give the Jummah khutbah, then he should understand the obligation is for him to take time out and go and study the deen. You ask a person who is a Muslim for 50, 60 years, that how many books of hadith have you read from cover to cover? I can kid you not, I can count the two, three books that probably the ummah has read if they're lucky. Someone's read Arba'in Nawi, someone's read Riyadh Salihin, possibly Fadail Amal, possibly they've read you know, Adab um, al-Mufrad by Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi While there are thousands and thousands of hadith collections that are absolutely untouched. You ask a person, have you read the tafsir of the Qur'an cover to cover? There's nothing to there, nothing there. Have you studied the Qur'an cover to cover with a shaykh? Have you ever read the Qur'an in front of a shaykh with every ayah properly recited? This was a common practice in our deen. And now the religious people have no answer? And now the people that are leading the ummah have no answer? Look at Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. How much time did he spend just doing khidmah of the Prophet ﷺ and studying from the Prophet of Allah? And he doesn't just become the, one of the leading scholars of the ummah and based off of his opinion that most of the Hanafi fiqh is established. He doesn't coincidentally become that person. He becomes that person after he is verified by the Prophet ﷺ. Nabi ﷺ tells the companions, this man is a hafid of the Qur'an. This man right here is a knowledgeable person. He sits in those gatherings of the Prophet of Allah and he's noting down the ilm of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's internalizing that ilm of the Prophet of Allah. And, he, and not only did he do, you know like, there's like there's, there are these um, sort of qualifiers and markers that you need to accomplish along the way for your ilm to be complete. A part of that is humility. A part of that is seeking. A part of that is understanding what ilm actually is and what it does. People say all the time, oh, ilm doesn't do anything. 
Well, that's not true. If you seek ilm uh, in an incomplete fashion, then it won't do anything for you. But if while seeking ilm, you, pr you properly just drown yourself in that knowledge, in that environment, you, while seeking knowledge, you see the pain of the ummah and the need of the ummah. While seeking that knowledge, you're making dua to Allah to accept you for the khidmah of the deen. While seeking that knowledge, you are punctual and regular and doing dhikr of Allah. While seeking that knowledge, you are doing khidmah of your mashayikh. Last night I was sitting with one student who was studying in a madrasa. He's back home for a break. So he's my neighbor. His family invited me over, so I sat with him. And one piece of advice I gave to the young man. That look buddy, don't obsess too much with which institution you study at. This is a distraction at times. It's easy to get caught into titles, labels, names, institutions, and kind of like, you know, sloganism. One of the scholars says, Kunna ummat al-diraya fasirna ummat al-raya. We used to be a people about deep understanding, and today all we are are flags. This is my camp, that's my camp, that's my camp. Forget all of this. What you need to understand is that no matter what institution you are at, how much you gain really depends on how much you're willing to invest in yourself, in your studies, and in building a relationship with your teachers. If you can do these three things, you will accomplish phenomenally. Otherwise, you can go to Pakistan, India, you can go to Saudi, you can go to uh, Azhar University in Egypt, you can go to Sudan if you want to, you can go to Malaysia. It's not really gonna make that big of a difference. Because you become your own greatest barrier. You have to overcome yourself before you're able to interact with anyone in the dunya. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an, beautifully, honestly, was a khadim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One time, a person came to meet Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, while Umar radiallahu an was in Arafah, he was, in, he was performing hajj. And that person, he said to Umar radiallahu an, that I have come from Kufa, and there is a man there who teaches the Qur'an and teaches the deen from memory, like he has it all down. Umar radiallahu an, his uh, personality was that he didn't like it when people um, spoke publicly. And even on top of that, Umar radiallahu an didn't like it when people were too confident in teaching the Qur'an and the sunnah. He felt that they should be a little careful. They should do shura, cut back on how much they share. He didn't like the sahaba that narrated too much hadith as well. He would hold them accountable and ask them for, for proof. Where did you study this hadith? And more than criticizing those companions, it was about setting a tone. It was about setting a culture that verify before you speak. If you have a feeling that you want to share a hadith of Rasulullah wasallam, don't share it until you have verified it. That much ghira and respect for the deen you should have. If you have a feeling that someone said some story to you, you want to share it again, hold back on sharing that until you're able to look into it a little. Ask someone about it. Solidify your knowledge before you speak. So Ibn, uh, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anh, became very angry when he heard that someone stands in Kufa openly reading the Qur'an, teaching the Qur'an, ala dhahri qalbihi, just you know, on the, you know, just openly on his, from his memory. So then Umar radiallahu anh asks, who is this person? In a state of anger. فَغَذِبَ عُمَرْ غَذْبًا قَلَّمَا غَذِبَ مِثْلَهُ In a very, you know, intense state of anger, he asked the man, who is this person? So the man said, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. That it's ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh. So Umar radiallahu anh's anger receded. He calmed down. And then he said, I do not know anyone on the face of this earth who is more worthy of what you described than him. He is a true scholar of the Qur'an. One day, we were with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, myself and Abu Bakr. And we were walking outside and we saw a person in the masjid reading some salah. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped to listen to the recitation. And the man reciting the Qur'an was reciting the Qur'an harfan harfan. Every letter was properly given its due. So then Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever wishes to hear the Qur'an be recited the way it was revealed, then he should listen to the Qur'an of this man, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. 
Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh finished his prayer and he started making dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was outside. And standing next to him, Abu Bakr and Umar. And while he's making dua, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is saying to Abu Bakr and Umar, but addressing Ibn Mas'ud. He's saying, Sal tu'ta. That you read such good Qur'an that now you ask, Allah is gonna give you. But Ibn Mas'ud can't hear the Prophet of Allah. Because the Prophet is talking to Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. He's saying, Oh, ask, ask, now it's time. You've read such good Qur'an, Allah is happy with you, now ask. So then Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, while he was making dua, he said, Allahumma inni as'aluka imanan la yartaddu, wa na'eeman la yanfadu, wa murafaqata nabiyyika Muhammad fi a'la jinan al-khuld. O oh Allah, give me iman that will never leave. And give me blessings that will never abandon me. And grant me the companionship of your Prophet in the highest eternal gardens of paradise. Umar radiallahu anhu, he, he, he was just so blown away by what happened. He said, you know what, tomorrow I'm going to go to Ibn Mas'ud and tell him what happened. That last night the Prophet was cheering you on without you knowing, and you were killing it on the recitation, and then the Prophet volleyed it to you and said, make dua, Allah is gonna accept, and you slam dunked it without even knowing that you were being volleyed. You, you just, last night you killed it. So, Umar radiallahu anh, the next morning he came to Sayyidina Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, and he found that Abu Bakr had already told Ibn Mas'ud everything. Faqala, Umar radiallahu anh said to Sayyidina Abu Bakr, إِنَّكَ لَسَبَّاقٌ بِالْخَيْرِ You always beat me to khair. I had a niyyah to make someone happy, but you already beat me to it. One time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he called Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, and he said to him, اِقْرَعْ عَلَيَّ Quran. Read. Read the Qur'an for me. This has to be like, the ultimate request. Like out of all the requests that could exist in the dunya, is the Prophet of Allah telling someone, you read the Qur'an, and read it for me. فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَقْرَوَ عَلَيْكَ وَعَلَيْكَ أُنزِلْ O Messenger of Allah, you want me to read the Qur'an for you, while the Qur'an was revealed unto you from Allah? Like on one side Jibreel is reading to you, I can't up that. I can't go there. Like you, revelation is, arrives to you directly. How am I going to read to you? فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ إِنِّي أَشْتَهِي أَنْ أَسْمَعَهُ مِنْ غَيْرِي I want to hear someone else read the Quran. Go for it. فَقَرَأْتُ عَلَيْهِ سُورَةَ النِّسَاءِ حَتَّى بَلَغْتُ فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَؤُلَاءِ شَهِيدًا He recited 41 verses of Surah An-Nisa. And then he recited the verse, how will it be when we will bring, when we will bring upon every nation a witness? And above all of those witnesses, you will be the witness of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he said in that moment, I peeked up to look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was pouring tears and he was crying by hearing his recitation and also the depth of the meaning of the verse. One time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam expressed his desire that it would be beautiful if someone were to read the Qur'an publicly for the Quraysh. So they can hear it, maybe it'll change their hearts. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh said, O Messenger of Allah, I got this. The Prophet of Allah said, it would be better if it was someone that had a clan behind them, some family, some wealth, some notoriety. So the Quraysh would be careful and would think twice before doing anything to the one who reads the Qur'an. He said, O Messenger of Allah, I got this. He waited for the right opportunity. It was midday, right in the early morning, before midday. And the Quraysh were seated around, seated around the Kaaba. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh arrives, and in front of everyone, from his heart. Therefore, one of the things the ulama, they write, he was the first person to read the Qur'an publicly in front of others by hifd, by hifd, from memory. He stood there in front of others and he began to recite out loud, Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan. Such a surah that when we hear it today, we cry, imagine 
this moment, that in front of the Kaaba, no one has done this before. The reciter is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh. The audience are the haters of Islam, the confidence, the strength. You know, when you believe in yourself, when you believe in yourself, and you, you know, and you believe in your iman, and you've invested, you can't believe what change will occur. Iqbal said, Jashmi aqwam se maghfihe haqiqat teri. The world hasn't seen your truth yet. Right? Zinda rakti he zamane ko hararat teri. In this cold, bitter world, it's your warmth that keeps everything going. Ibn Rasul radiallahu anhu, what this hararat al iman is. Read in the Quran. The Quraysh, they saw him and they said, How dare this man read the Quran like this? And they got up and gave him a beatdown. And they started beating Ibn Masood radiallahu anh, they hit him and hit him so much. Ibn Masood radiallahu anh was bruised and covered in blood. He escaped that gathering and he came back and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw him and said, this is why I didn't want you to go. He says, O Messenger of Allah, I swear, in that moment when they were attacking me, they were weak and I was strong. They, they, there was never a moment where they were more weak in my eyes with all of their strength than in that moment. And if I was told to do this again, I would go right now. This is how he becomes a scholar of the Qur'an. Through mujahada, through sacrifice, through khidmah, through studying the deen properly. You know, the Qur'an is just something different. A person that commits to it, understands it, engages with it. It's a big mistake on our behalf for those of us as parents who teach our children to read the Qur'an and don't teach them what the Qur'an is saying. It's a big injustice. Very big injustice. We're not showing them. Yes, there are verses of the Qur'an that require scholarly guidance. We should teach them that. That these are verses, you know, these are fiqhi verses and these are more complicated verses, mutashabihat. Let them be. But what about these other verses of the Qur'an that are uplifting. Yesterday I met a man. He said to me that, uh, he said, Sheikh, I serve as uh, uh, a khatib in one of the local prisons here in the community. So I go to the community and I teach there. And the prisoners have recently been guaranteed access to tablets. And there are certain pre-approved uh, resources that they are allowed to benefit from. This is prisons in the whole region. I'm talking about through the state of Texas. And one of those pre-approved resources that they can listen to are, one of them is the Qalam podcast. So all the prisoners throughout America are listening to these Tuesday halakas. All the inmates throughout the whole Texas area are listening to hard work and listen to Sheikh Mikhail Zdars. So, the prisoners that I was visiting, they said to me, and I'm conveying this amana to you, that they don't, there is no pre-approved recitation of the Qur'an they can listen to, they desire to listen to the Qur'an. So they made a request. Can the Qalam Institute upload a recitation of the Qur'an so they can listen to it from their cells? We have the Qur'an in front of us. Honestly, I was in tears when he said this to me. We have the Qur'an right here and no one touches it. This Qur'an is saying, Ya Rabbi, inna qawm ittakhadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura. And there you have someone, for whatever reason, one reason or another, may Allah protect all of us, forgive all of us, and if we are wrong, if those that are there, you know, without any jurmin that are innocent, may Allah free them. And those that have done wrong, may Allah do islah of them, and do islah of us. Right? You guys know about Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam, and how he was wrongly imprisoned in the dhulm that happened on him. And that person from there is saying, Ya Allah, I wish someone would read the Qur'an so we can listen to it. We don't, we don't know how to read it. I wish I could listen to it. La ilaha illallah. Ibn Masood radiallahu anh, one day he climbed a tree and the companions were looking at him from the bottom and he had thinner legs, his shins were small. So the companions begin to laugh at him. فَضَحِكُوا مِنْ حُمُوشَةِ سَاقِيهِ because his legs were thin and small, they begin to laugh at him. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ The Prophet of Allah said, How, Why are you laughing? 
this man's legs are more heavier in the scale on the Day of Judgment than the entire mountain of Uhud. يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمُنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ دَرَجَاتِ One time there was a caravan traveling. And in the caravan was Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. That caravan crossed the caravan of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. This is the Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa. He has a caravan. And on the other side, there is one of Ibn Mas'ud. But they didn't know Ibn Mas'ud was in the middle. So when Umar radiallahu anhu asked that, where are you guys from? So he responded back by saying, we are coming from Al-Fajj al-Amiq. Min Al-Fajj al-Amiq, ay Al-Wadi al-Amiq. Making a reference, Fajr al-Amiq making reference to the Quranic verse. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, where are you going? So then he said, Al-Bayt al-Atiq, making another Quranic reference. So Umar radiallahu anhu said to his companions that they have a scholar among them. Somewhere among them is a scholar. So then he, فَأَمَنَ رَجُلًا فَنَادَاهُمْ Umar radiallahu anhu said, okay, ask them. أَيُّ الْقُرْآنِ أَعْضَمْ What is the greatest verse of the Qur'an? فَأَجَابَهُ He responded back to him, اللَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ الْحَيُّ الْقَيُّومِ لَا تَأْخُذُهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا نَوْمِ Ayatul Kursi He then said, okay, now ask him, أَيُّ الْقُرْآنِ أَحْكَمْ Which verse of the Qur'an gathers all of the legal rulings in one place? فَأَجَابَهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَيَنْهَا عَنِ الْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ وَالْبَغْرِ Surah Al-Nahl He then said, okay, which verse of the Qur'an is the most concise verse? Answer this one. أَيُّ الْقُرْآنِ أَجْمَعَ فَقَالْ فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًا يَرَهُ This summarizes everything. Whoever did any good in this world will see it in the hereafter, and whoever did evil in this world will see it in the hereafter. So Umar radiallahu anhu said, Okay, أَيُّ الْقُرْآنِ أَخْوَفْ Which verse of the Qur'an creates the most fear in the reader? فَأَجَابَهُ لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ وَلَا يَجِدْ لَهُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نُصِيرًا That the criminals and crooks will have no one to save them. This is the most terrifying verse of the Qur'an, that those who did wrong, they will have to face Allah. وَلَا يَجُدْ لَهُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا And he said, okay, أَيُّ الْقُرْآنِ أَرْجَى Then tell me which verse of the Qur'an is the most hopeful for the Ummah. فَأَجَابَهُ قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِن رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, O servants of mine who have wronged themselves, do not become despondent of Allah's mercy. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ So Umar radiallahu anh, after asking all these questions of the Qur'an and getting all the right answers, he asked, أَفِيكُمْ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنُ مَسْعُودِ Seems like there's only one person. You, know, you, you guys ever play the Guess Who game? Who has glasses? So Umar radiallahu anh asked all the questions and there was only one candidate left. Afikum Abdullah bin Mas'ud that among you is Abdullah bin Mas'ud. Qalu Allahumma na'am. Yes. Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh is right with us. When Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anh was on his deathbed, Actually, before that, I'll just share one or two things. Ibn Masood would give dars to his students every Thursday, Yom al Khamis. And people loved his dars. So they said to him, that Why don't you give us dars two times a week, three times a week? So Ibn Masood said, Because if I give you more than once, then you, won't, you will get tired. You won't pay attention, you will lose interest. And this shows us the hikmah of Abdullah ibn Masood. That everything has a frequency. Everything has a time. Everything has a place. One time, Ibn Masood, he said, 
Man arad al adharra bid dunya. Whoever seeks the akhirah will lose out on the dunya. Man arad al dunya adharra bil akhirah. And whoever seeks the dunya will lose out in the akhirah. Ya qawm, O people, fa'adhirru bil fani lil baqi. Miss out. Go, be okay with losing out on that which is perishing and invest in that which is everlasting. Keep yourself focused. Ibn Masood said, If I ever made a joke of a dog, I fear that I would become one. He was a person of great khawf, that never harm anyone, never do wrong to another person. And I dislike, وَإِنِّي لَأَكَرَهْ أَنْ أَرَى رَجُلَ فَارِغًا لَيْسَ فِي عَمَلِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا دُنْيَا I don't like seeing a person who is just sitting around doing nothing making no contribution to the dunya or making no contribution to the akhirah. These are some of the sayings and some of the advices of Ibn Masood When Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood was on his deathbed, Uthman ibn Affan an came to visit him. And he asked him, Uthman an asked him, how are you feeling? Do you have any pain, any worries, any complaints? Ma tashtaki? So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Masood said, Dhunubi. I complain of my sins. So Uthman radiallahu anh asked him, فَمَا تَشْتَهِ What do you desire? قَالَ رَحْمَةَ رَبِّي I desire the rahma of my Rabb. Uthman radiallahu anh said to him, Don't worry. I will set aside a stipend for your family. He had daughters. We will take care of your family after you leave. Ibn Masood radiallahu anh responded, لا حاجة لي به I don't need a stipend for my daughters or my children. Uthman radiallahu anh said to him, أتخشى على No, he said to him, يكون لي بناتك من بعدك This will support your family. So Ibn Masood radiallahu anh says, there's no need to fear any poverty for my daughters. For I told them to read Surah Waqi'ah every night. And I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, مَنْ قَرَأَ الْوَاقِعَةَ كُلَّ لَيْلَةٍ لَمْ تُصِبْهُ فَاقَةٌ أَبَدًا That whoever reads Surah Waqi'ah every night will never face starvation. This I heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an gave wasiyah to Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu an to lead him. He passed away in the city of Medina Munawwara and is buried in the graveyard of Baqi'ah. He was of the age of 63 according to one narration. And some scholars just keep it vague and say that it was somewhere in his 60s. Bid'an wa sittina sanatan. Yahya bin Bukayr says he passed away in the year 33 Hijri. While other ulama, they say it was in the year 32 Hijri. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this gathering from us and allows us to benefit from the example of the righteous and pious. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, grant us commitment to the Qur'an and to studying the deen and to serving the ulama and mashayikh. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, allow this to continue in our progeny and in the Muslim ummah until the Day of Judgment. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.